Today I want to talk about the conquest of faith. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 14, beginning with verse 20. The conquest of faith. I want to read two verses first, and then I want to read the rest of my text. But I want this to sink in your mind because Jesus is coming off perhaps the greatest miracle outside of the miracle of the resurrection of Lazarus and those whom he brought back from the dead, this would have to be, without question, one of the greatest miracles that Jesus did. He fed not 5,000, he fed 5,000 men and women and children. So we're talking about 12 to 15,000 people people. In fact, it says in Matthew 14, verses 20 and 21, listen, and they did all eat. Everyone say that with me. And they did all eat and were filled and they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. Now think about this. Church, think about how the disciples are still reeling from this miracle. Think how they're overwhelmed as the people are saying, He indeed is the Christ who is to come. He indeed is the Messiah. He is the Son of God because of the miracles. Jesus later upbraided them because he said, You followed me, not just because of the miracles, but because of the bread that you ate and the fish that you ate. But have no doubt in your minds, already the buzz was, this is the one who is to come. But follow along. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Now, I missed verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And then verse 24. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. And, but straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Father, bless the reading of your word today. Make it applicable to our hearts. Help us to to walk away today, not simply with our eyes illuminated, but Lord, let us stand firmly upon the faith that you have given us that no matter whether we're on the mountain or on the sea, the storms that are beating down upon us, we can still trust in you with all of our hearts. Everyone said, amen. After one of the greatest victories, as I said, the disciples are reeling from this experience. No doubt their faith must have been increased. You could not have watched Jesus handle this situation when he asked questions, boys, what are we going to do? Well, there's not enough money. Even if we got all of our money together, we couldn't go into town and buy enough food. Then they brought this boy with five loaves and two fishes. But as Philip said, 
What are they among so many? So think how they must have felt when they saw Jesus take control. When we have come to the end of our rope, when there's no alternatives, there's no other open doors, why is it then that we turn to Jesus? Why don't we come to him first? Why is it that we try everything else and then we come to Jesus? And finally they said, Lord, there's nothing else that we can do. All we have are these five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus took them and he said, make the men sit down. Have them seated. And Jesus took control. Where did the miracle happen? How did the miracle happen? You can't feed 15,000 people with five loaves and two fishes and have 12 baskets full of fragments left over. So where did the miracle begin? I'll tell you. I submit to you, the miracle began at the breaking of the bread and the fish. Do you know, as I've said many times, Jesus cannot use anything that cannot be broken. Whatever it is that you give to God, if you give it to him so gingerly and say, Lord, take this, but please be careful. It's my new car. It's, it's my new home. I just bought it. I just got the mortgage. Lord, I'll give it to you, but please be careful. All right, let's get a little closer to home. These are my children, Lord. Notice, these are my children, Lord. I'm going to give them to you, but you take care of them. This is my husband, Lord. I'm going to give him to you, but Lord, don't break him. You know what? Maybe the very thing that God or your husband needs is for God to break him. But look with Paul. Everything that Paul touched got broken. Everything that in his life, he said, I was shipwrecked how many times? He was broken how many times? He was beaten. He was left for dead. He was stoned at Lystra. How many times? Over and over and over again was this man broken. And David said, the sacrifices of God are what? The best sacrifices, the best animals that we can give? No. No. The sacrifices of God are a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Oh, God, you will not turn away. So Jesus broke the bread. He broke the fish, the fishes, and as he distributed, the miracle came from the breaking. In the upper room, Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. Jesus, to bring salvation, to be the paschal lamb, to bring atonement for the whole world, had to be broken. Everything Jesus uses has to be broken. Sir, if you can't be broken, God can't use you. Well, this is my ministry, and I've worked hard. It's not your ministry. It's God's ministry. And when you give it to him, he's going to take it, and he's going to break it. Look at Mary with the Spikner box. This was expensive. This was a year's worth of earnings. And she took it to Jesus and she broke it. Had she not broken it, the smell of that beautiful perfume that prepared Jesus for his death would never have been smelled and it never would have been used for its purpose. Have you ever noticed the thing about the beauty of that moment was she wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. She poured the oil over, the perfume over his head. So the same aroma that filled Jesus was also on her. When God breaks us, there is a spiritual brokenness and it's the smell and the aroma of heaven. Paul even says that. We are a drink that is poured out. We are a perfume to those who are saved of life unto life for those who are dying to those death unto death. 
So Jesus performs this great miracles. The disciples, I can just hear them saying, now we're talking. Now we're getting somewhere. Now he's going to bring the kingdom to bear upon the earth. James and John, they pause from their bickering over who is the greatest. The disciples have stopped fighting over who's going to sit at his right hand and his left hand only for a moment because they think now we have arrived. But Jesus says to them, boys, get in the boat. This was not a suggestion. This was a command. To constrain someone is not to suggest it's not an idea, it's a command. And Jesus, look, and Jesus, verse 22, constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Boys, get in the boat. Go to the other side. What about the multitudes? I'll take care of the multitudes. He sent them back home sent the disciples into the mouth of a storm. He planned it. He perpetrated it. They were to get in a boat and go into the very teeth of a storm that they could not handle. Now I want you to see something, folks. For those of you who have a theology that says God never sends us into storms or bad places, you better study your theology a little deeper. God does not keep us. He doesn't exempt us from storms. He blesses us and grows us through the storms because he is walking with us and he carries us when we can't go any longer. You do not grow by avoiding tribulation. You do not avoid uh, the, the storms in life, the temptations that come with it. You do not grow by avoiding temptations. He sent them into a storm. But notice, where did he go? He went into a mountain to pray for them. Beloved, Jesus is our interceding lamb. Do you think that he just walks around heaven to hear the angels sing his praises and the heavenly choir sing the anthems? No. The Bible says he is the interceding lamb who is praying for you and for me that we're going to get through this no matter what happens. We're going to make it. He is able to keep us to that day. He is able. I want you to say it with me. He is able. Say it again. He is able. There's nothing that you will face that God will not give you the grace and the power and the love to get through it. The problem is we want to look two months down the, the road and say, I want to take care of everything for the next two months. That's not how God works. For some of you right now, you may be in a season of prosperity. Everything you touch is turned to gold. It's just like you have the Midas touch. Pastor, I don't know about you, but it's been pretty good for me. You talk about losses. You talk about tribulation. You talk about hurting. You talk about divorce. You talk about bankruptcy. You talk about losing your home. To be honest with you, I, you know, I like to run in better company than that. Well, I'll tell you, don't hang around Christians because Christians go through difficult times. Do I hear an amen? amen. I, I love what Jack Taylor said. He said that uh, he was in a service one time and everybody was talking about, you know, how, how everything was just so wonderful and, uh, you know, in their salvation they have... Uh, eternal life and that's great and but then they started saying and everything is going so well and then one little lady she stood up she said well I don't know about the rest of y'all but she said when I got saved all hell broke loose <laughs> that's how you grow folks you don't grow on the mountaintops I love the mountain of transfiguration I love that story 
I can see Peter and James and John. They must have been abashed to see. Jesus said in himself, some of you will not pass away until you see the Son of God coming in his glory. Most people think, well, that must have been the ram. What is he talking about? He was talking about Peter, James, and John. They went to the mountain of transfiguration. While they're there, the glory of God came down on that mountain, and there before Peter, James, and John, there's Elijah, there's Jesus, and there's Moses. Can you imagine that company? Can you imagine how that must have felt? The glory of God has descended upon the mountain. There God's great prophet and patriarch or, or emancipator and Jesus, the son of God, and Peter says, hey, let's just stay here and build three booths and we won't even go down into the valley again. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I could just sit and enjoy that all day long. But the Bible says God's glory came down like a fog and it engulfed Moses and Elijah and Jesus. And the Bible says, and when the glory disappeared, there was one man, Jesus only. And Jesus said, now boys, it's time to go to the valley. Now it's time to walk through tribulation. You've enjoyed the blessing of the mountaintop. You've enjoyed the wonderful blessing and the sight of God's Shekinah glory descending upon the mountain. But you don't live here. This is not heaven. Now we go down into the valley of human experience. Now we go down into the valley of human exploitation. When they went down, there was a father who had a lunatic son, as he called him. And he went to Jesus and he said, I have a son who is so full of devils that they throw him into the fire and into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, but they could not deliver him. What did Jesus say? Oh, you have a little faith. Where's your faith? He said, some come out only by prayer and fasting. So we know that there must have been many demons. But Jesus looked around and said, boys, you have the power to deliver this boy. You have the anointing. You have the promise. You have the authority to deliver this boy of demons. Deliver him. Well, what about the mountain? You don't deal with demon possession. You don't deal with sickness. When the glory of God, you don't deal with those things. It's when you walk through the tribulation and the storms of life when you begin to see it's God's power, it's God's anointing, it's God's grace that is going to get you through this tribulation. And that's why David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it's not a destination, it's a passageway. Whatever you're going through right now, you say, Pastor, you don't know. I am literally on my last letter. They're going to repossess my home. I'm losing my job. I don't have money. You are passing through this valley, and you're going to come to the other side. He's going to walk through with you. And there will be times you don't even know or understand how you get through it, but the promise is you will get through it. Don't you give up. Don't you quit. Don't you think there's sin in your life. God is growing your faith. Listen to me. God is more concerned about your being Christ-like than he is about your being comfortable. Do I hear an amen? Amen. I love creature comforts. Trust me, I love creature comforts. I'm not a person who loves to camp out. All of you outdoors people, bless you. <laughs> to me, an outdoor experience is a, a hotel that happens to have a few units away from the big tall tower. That's my experience of camping out. I like nice things. But hear me. When we go through those experiences, 
what happens? The enemy fills us with fear. And you know what the first thing is that we do? We consult with everyone else. Let's say the doctor says to you, we found something and we want to do further studies. Oh my God, it's got to be cancer. Or he, he's, he's hiding something from me. And I'll get, big, I'll get back with you in a few days. And uh, in fact, we'll call you next week. Or it may be the following week, but we'll get a hold of you. And he walks out of the room, and what do you say? The first thing you say is, oh, my goodness, he has found something. It's got to be cancer. Oh, I, and you go home, you pick up the phone, you call Aunt Betsy, and you say to Aunt Betsy, Aunt Betsy, the doctor said, we've got to do more studies. I know that he knows something. He just wouldn't tell me, and it looked bad. It was ominous. I could feel it. I know that it's something. And Aunt Betsy says, yes, well, you remember Aunt Bertha. She had something just like that that she went through. And they told her the same thing. They said, we'll get back with you. And they waited four or five days, and then it was another week. And when they called back, they said, we found something, and it was a cancerous cell, and they had to take it out. And, and that, Oh, that must be what I have. Do you see how the enemy works? And we fall right into it. Then we call somebody and say, well, Aunt Betsy said that Aunt Bertha had the same thing, and I know if it's family, it's probably genetic, I probably have the same thing. You are confessing everything the enemy wants you to confess. You're confessing sickness, you're confessing cancer, you're confessing possible death, and the enemy is laughing all the way back to the pit of hell. When we need to say, I don't care what they have found. He is not the final word. God is in control of my situation and he will deliver me. And I confess I am healed. I am whole. I am well. And God is the great physician. He's the one who has the final word. But notice... The scripture says, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Ship was now in the midst, in the middle of the sea. And the wind was contrary. The boat was no doubt about to tip over. The disciples start panicking. What's the first thing that happens? What's the most natural thing? It's fear. And nowhere in Scripture does it say that you won't ever feel fear. Jehoshaphat, remember, when they came in to him and they said, Sire, we are encompassed. We are surrounded by the enemy. Everywhere we look, there are armies ready to send upon us. And what did Jehoshaphat, the Bible says, and Jehoshaphat feared. That's the first proclivity you will have. The first thing that you'll feel is fear. The Bible says, casting down imaginations. Casting down imaginations. That fear is an imagination. They may be surrounding you, but no one said they're going to win. They are simply out there, just like Goliath was out there before David and the Israelites, but God had a different plan for Israel, and God has a different plan for you. Listen to me. You are not going to be overtaken by this situation. Do you hear me? You are not going under for the last time. God is coming and he's going to lift you and carry you through this terrible time you're experiencing. Hallelujah. I'm not going to walk in fear. I'm not walking out this door today, coming in here and praising God and using the names of God, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shammah, Jehovah Sid Kenu, all of these things, we praise God. He's my helper. He's my defender. He's my salvation. He's my strong tower. And then we walk out and we start confessing fear. You may not have two pennies to rub together, but you're a child of God. You are a son or a daughter of royalty, and God is not going to leave you or forsake you. So what happens in the midst of the storm? 
They're about to go under. And look, the fourth watch of the night, which is about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Now hear me. I told the first service, some of you remember uh, the Gonzalez kid from Cuba uh, that came over. Remember, it was an international incident because his mother drowned as well as the people, and he survived on an inner tube. And he came to family in Miami, and they held him, and then the father learned of it, and they sent him to Washington, and there was this big hubbaloo, and the president said that uh, the family in Miami needed to give up. Elion was his name. They need to, you need to give him back. He's got to go back to his father. And they said, no, his mother gave her life that the kid could come to this country, and so we're going to keep him right here in this house in Miami. And so as much as they tried to, to talk them out of it, they weren't going to hear it. So what they decided to do was that they would send in a team from the FBI and they would take the child, if necessary, at gunpoint. Do you know when they came in? They came in at the fourth watch of the night. After they had taken Elion, because everyone, most people were asleep, there was an AP reporter that was staying at the house and took the picture. But they asked an FBI agent later, why did, you got, did they go in at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning? And he said, because that is the time when your faculties are at their weakest. That's when you, as an individual, are at your weakest defensively. So they chose that time to rush into the house and capture that child. It was the fourth watch of the night, the time when defenses were down. The disciples were overwhelmed with water beating down, tossing that little boat at any time, about to tip it over. And Jesus comes walking on the water. Hey, listen to me. God is never early. Rarely early, I should say. But he's never late. He's never late. You may say, I wish God would come a little bit earlier. But listen to me. Jesus could have come to them at the moment that the storm arose. And he would have received glory. Would he not? Just like Lazarus. When Lazarus was sick, if Jesus had gone at that moment while Lazarus was sick and walked into his bedroom and said, Lazarus, come forth. Get out of that bed. He would have received glory. But he waited that he might receive a greater glory. And some of you, you have been praying about this. I don't know why God will not answer this prayer. I've been praying this prayer, and it seems like my prayers are just hitting the roof or ceiling, and they're not going any higher. Listen to me. God is going to deliver you, but he's going to deliver you on his timetable. Do you hear me? The disciples are anxious. They're worried. It's the fourth watch of the night. It's their weakest moment. It's a time when they're ready to despair and give up. And here comes Jesus walking on the water. And as I said a few weeks ago, you can never conquer your tribulation or your problem until you see Jesus conquering it first. Jesus has to walk on the water before you can walk on the water. Jesus has to take you through the tribulation or has to be there over it before he delivers you from it. And Peter sees, well, they see a ghost and they start crying out for fear because they think it's a ghost. Notice what Jesus says, and I'm, I'm hurrying. He says, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. Listen again. Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Do you know that was the characteristic greeting of Jesus? Always, be of good cheer, do not be afraid, it is I. Don't worry, don't be afraid, it is I. Listen, he did not say, it's Jesus. 
If he had to say, it's Jesus, then they were in big trouble. Why? Because the sheep know the shepherd's voice. Now let me ask you, do you know his voice today? If you know his voice, he doesn't have to say, hey, it's Jesus. All he has to say is, it is I. Be not afraid. Be of good comfort. Don't you be afraid. Some of you right now, you're going through a tribulation. You don't know why you had to go through a divorce. Maybe God will reveal it before eternity, and maybe he won't. You say, I don't know why I had to go through this. I don't know why I lost a child. I don't know why my business failed. I don't know why I've gotten this report. God is going to receive greater glory by what he is doing in your life if you trust in him. But you must trust in him. I want to read two verses before I close. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. Everyone say that with me. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Hallelujah. God is in the midst of your trouble and he is bringing joy. He is bringing peace. He's even singing over your situation. So why are you so downcast, oh my soul? He is in the midst of your problems, in the midst of your tribulation. He's mighty. And he will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. I love that. He will rest in his love. If he will rest in his love, you should rest in his love. You don't rest in anxiety. Some of you don't even sleep at night. You walk the floors and you say, oh, I'm just praying. No, you're not. You're worrying. And then he will joy over thee with singing. Do you know God's singing over your problems? You're sitting there and you're saying, I don't know if we're even going to get through this. And the Lord is mighty in the midst. He will rejoice over thee with singing. Now, how many of you right now, you're going through a tribulation, a problem of some kind? Let's see your hand. Hold it up high. Put your hand up. How many of you believe that God is going to deliver you? I want everyone to stand at their feet. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God is here. There is no one here whose situation is beyond hope. Ma'am, God is going to provide the finances for your family. You receive that in the name of Jesus. You receive that promise. The Lord in the midst of thee is mighty. There's no devil in hell that can steal from you what God has given to you. He will send his angels and he will give his angels charge concerning thee lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now, if that is you, again, you're going through, maybe it's the finality of a breakup of a relationship, maybe a marriage. Maybe you found that your spouse was having an affair. Maybe you failed miserably. You say, Pastor, I, I don't know what to do. The Bible says he's very close to those who are broken in spirit. And if you will confess, God will forgive you. God will turn the situation around. Right now, there are several people and you are anxious and you are worried. You're worried over your children. You're worried over your job. 
You're worried over your car or your home. You need to release that worry. If you cannot release it, listen, God can't take it as long as you have control of it. You have to surrender that unto the Lord. I want you to lift your hands right now. I want you to repeat this prayer with me. And if you confess this with your mouth and believe in your heart, then God is going to deliver you through this. But you have to surrender. You have to release this to God. You can't release it and then try and pick it up a day later. You've got to lay it down and you have to walk away from that burden and let God deal with it. Pray this with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm facing a tremendous tribulation. Father, I'm in the midst of a storm. And just as the disciples whom you sent, Lord, you have sent me into this storm. And I surrender my life to you. I surrender my family, my finances, my health. I surrender it all to you. And Lord, I'm going to walk away and let you deal with this. I trust you with all of my heart, with all of my being. Today, as I walk out this door, I'm going to walk out in victory. I am not defeated. I am not overcome. I am victorious. And Father, I give you all the praise for what you're going to do. And my miracle is just ahead. And I trust you. I believe you. It will come to pass. In Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Amen. God bless you for being with us today. Have a wonderful week of blessings.